Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have artist, retoucher, and educator Stefan Sackmiller as tonight's guest speaker. Stefan holds an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. His artistic practice is an exploration into our evolving perception and experience of nature in modern life. Exhibitions include International Center of Photography, Times Square Art Alliance, and the Griffin Museum of Photography. His latest project, Schema, was published by Sun Editions. Stefan serves as principal at New York City retouching studio Cyan Jack, where he has worked on numerous national and international advertising campaigns. As such, he has won the Communication Arts Photo Annual Award of Excellence. His work has been published widely in Vogue, Art Forum, Interview, W, and the New York Times. So please help me welcome Stefan Sackmiller to our lecture series. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Katrine. Thank you, SVA. It's really an honor to be here speaking to you guys today. Um, and I, I think it's particularly uh, apropos that I, I recently graduated, you know, three to four years ago. And much of this talk is, is um, surrounding my experience um, both pre, during, and, and post-graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, so I, I think you'll find that um, pretty applicable. Um, so a little bit about me. I, uh, I'm originally from Seattle. Um, I, I had these amazing experiences out in, in, in the rural areas of Seattle um, that are very unlike they are here. But yet I packed up a couple of boxes and I took an Amtrak without ever having even visited uh, New York City or even anything in the, the East Coast. So. Uh, I just arrived in Penn Station and started there. Um, the first project uh, on returning back to Seattle from that experience in New York, um, just as a vacation, I didn't, I didn't move back, but um, the first project there was this project related. And it became the foundation for the work that I would do in graduate school. and. What I was looking at was mainly my family as they existed in the types of typical places you would find in the Northwest. Uh, but there was a question that surrounded all of the images that I continue to focus on even to this day. Um, all of my work is, is related to a sort of singular um, goal, uh, a singular mindset, a singular subject. Although you'll see many subjects, there's, there's always one thing that ties everything together, and that's the epistemology of nature. It's this question, uh, epistemology is a philosophical term, basically meaning what is nature? We ask that question. How do we come to know it? And how is it that we know what we know about it? It's a, it's a pretty simple question to ask, uh, but the, the more I ask, uh, the less I, I seem to come to any kind of concrete conclusion, which is um, something that just keeps driving work, which is uh, an amazing thing to start with that. So it's really just a simple goal to understand nature. Time is, is kind of a fickle thing in photographs. Um, and, and how I created these was I was making hundreds of small four by six prints and I just had them laid out in the studio. I was literally just swimming in prints, kind of arranging one to the next, um, looking at the way that, that time uh, became sort of deep time in the way that geologic time uh, actually occurs I in, the, in the landscape. Uh, and also how like space and, and place and time all, all relate to one another. Uh, you get a sense from these images, like what kinds of environments. I mean, some of these are photographs from my home. Um, some of them are from backyards. But it, it's just such a different place than 25th Street in Manhattan. Uh, this is an image. Uh, uh, we, we've closed the related project. Uh, this is an image of me. Uh, I'm four years old. and. Uh, 
we took uh, many trips um, to not just, you know, Seattle's a somewhat rural area. It's not particularly remote, but this, uh, this particular trip, I, I was out in the Bowron um, Lakes, which is northern Minnesota, uh, completely remote, like nothing for, for God knows how many miles. Uh, and we were there for 30 days at a time. So that's a pretty significant experience to have at such a young age. And uh, it, it's affected everything that I've done since. Um, this is me at three years old. Uh, I actually wanted to be an architect when I, when I grew up. Uh, it never quite happened. It turned out there was way too much math involved. Um, <coughs> I did actually, <laughs> I did have a couple of days with the architect, but I think he, he understood very clearly that, that that was not the path for me. Although, to my surprise, I've become somewhat of a, a closeted, uh, architect in, in a way looking at landscape architecture and you'll kind of see that connection as we go on. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about like how much research goes into some of these projects. Um, it's not that I'm just sort of moving about the landscape just seeing what I see. Uh, having gone to grad school I know that everyone's process is very different and uh, I could see right away that my process was um, was perhaps way too thorough. I, I got that comment lots. Uh, but it's my life and uh, I really enjoy the library, I, even if it's not that popular. Um, it's something, it's, I, I just enjoy this topic. I, I'm absolutely p just fascinated by it. And um, so the amazing thing about the RISD grad program is that there's this connection to Brown University, which is this wonderful university and they have one of the best natural history departments in the country. And so I was taking um, proper academic coursework in natural history and I was introduced to a writer named Bill Cronin who wrote um, a, a wonderful essay and, and of course many, many books thereafter about similar topics uh, called The Trouble with Wilderness. And um, he came up with three myths of nature. Uh, the first is uh, nature is Eden. Uh, and by that he means an Edenic narrative. Uh, and that's a nature that's kind of stable, but yet uh, if any sort of humanity comes in, then that nature would be sort of out of balance. Um, he's also got another one that's a, just a very typical myth you hear about nature, and nature as naive reality. Um, that would be one that is, uh, it's sort of, we see nature, uh, even though it's a cultural construct, as something that is because it's nature, then it's real. It's a concrete real. Yet, um, that's just a very common fallacy. Um, and, and then the last one, nature is moral imperative. That is, as Americans, that's something that we have a really hard time letting go of. And that's what this uh, slide, uh, I came upon it in the library and it just really hit me. It's probably uh, in the most clearly uh, formal appropriation of of moral nature that I've ever seen, a painting a flag just right in the middle of the sky. That's, um, I mean, Frederick Edwin Church is America's painter. I, I really, I absolutely love him, but at the same time, uh, I can't deny the fact that he's used nature in this way. That's it's really curious. Um, this painting, it, another amazing Frederick Edwin Church. Um, this is 1857. This is probably one of his most popular, and, uh, and by popular, I mean pop. I'm, uh, people drove from hundreds of miles away to go see this thing. They paid 25 cents to see one painting. I don't think that's, maybe that's happened before. I certainly know of nothing within my lifetime of that kind of um, intensity and interest in one painting or, or one photograph for that matter. Um, but I show this to sort of illustrate um, the sort of vicissitude uh, verisimilitude of uh, painting, the, the amount of detail uh, everyone marveled at. Um, and it, it was also just the, the falls themselves. And um, this is the same fall uh, in 1969 on the left, uh, after agriculture and um, other industry had pulled so much water out of the Niagara Falls that there really, it was basically a trickle as you can see. Uh, and this was of a big concern, yet it took many, many years to um, do
do anything about it. But it, it's something, the reason I chose this is it's something that I've always thought of as a sort of like, if I was to draw a, a list of nature, it, it, would, it would fall right in there. The Niagara Falls, I mean, that's Frederick Edwin Church. That's what we've based um, all of our ideas on. And um, yet it, there's this, uh, this manipulation of it in a way that's so um, revealing of what nature could really mean. Uh, the, the fact that, that later in the 1990s, we finally got there, there was, I'll save you the long story, but um, it, see, it has seen very many iterations in the actual landscape. And they were talking about, you know, how grand should it be? Should we put a rock to the left or to the right? Um, it was a lot of thought that, that went into it. Um, so that I take that same kind of research uh, just in making the trips to, to any particular area to photograph. And my next trip was to Yosemite National Park. And the first thing that really struck me about the park was this map, which uh, if you can get a sense of the scale, I mean, you really you can't unless you've, you've been there and tried to walk anywhere. It's extraordinarily large. Uh, and all you're seeing there is, is the, that one small road that runs through the middle, which was very contested, by the way. And the, in the lower left, you've got Yosemite Valley, which I'll, I'll blow up in a second. Um, but uh, there's very little of the National Park that we're actually seeing. And it really it, that blew my mind that I could go there and I could spend a week. And I just I couldn't see all of it. And then, so I wasn't interested in, in cataloging the whole park. Um, I was interested in what people were actually seeing, like how, how that process was directed. And through my research, I found out that Frederick Law Olmsted, um, who was the designer of the Central Park that we all know and love, uh, was the first person they called when they um, decided to create Yosemite National Park. Uh, they, s they asked him to basically come up with uh, a system for viewing. And, and he cataloged the park himself and decided on the best uh, loop. I believe there's a Frederick Law Olmsted carriage road, but don't uh, quote me on that exactly. I, I'm certain that the original path still exists and you can travel it. Uh, and most of that is in uh, the valley itself, which you can see there. Uh, and the other reason I wanted to point out this uh, particular map is that uh, the thing that struck me most uh, also about the directing of one's view when you go to the National Park is uh, that you're, you're first introduced by the visitor center. It's like this, um, like we know you're not going to be able to figure out how to look at this. So you should stop here and we'll give you some tips. Um, kind of a, just a, it's, a, it's a very consistent structure across all of the national parks. And I've visited 31 of them. Um, so that brings us to Nature by Proxy, which is a three-part series, and, and the first one being parks. I'm going to talk about my experience in natural history museums and the clouds. I kind of work in a trilogy uh, format like that. Um, and uh, I'll just run through the slides here. Obviously, Grand Canyon for you lovers out there. <laughs> this one I found very curious because I was actually working in the, Na the Natural History Museum shortly after and almost during this this trip and this construction of the view and this cyc cyclorama um, format just seemed so much like a natural history museum diorama. I just backed up and it's like, it's exactly what was framed. These people had actually just seen a, um, a baby bear cub try to climb up a tree. Uh, I. I took a trip with um, Hasselblad camera owners um, to kind of survey their interest in the landscape. So that there's a whole week's worth of work, but that was the photo, Glacier National Park. <coughs> and then the classic Ansel view in Yosemite Valley. 
so just returning briefly back to uh, this is artist point. Um, it it was one of the first major paintings of the national parks, um, Thomas Moran, uh, and it's and it's a view I've continued to come back to uh, because of its uh, fixation on the on the picturesque and and they actually have a they have the painting right next to the view like it's on a it's on a board it's just sitting there and they've got the rotundra and then the board and you're just like they invite you to kind of compare and contrast with with the painting that's such a surreal experience and then I just started collecting images <laughs> of all of the artist points I can find there's just so many I mean this is just this is all I could fit on one slide um, there's FDR in the middle uh, his photograph with artist point so many different versions uh, and, and then I, I looked at the natural history museums and I found that uh, you know the in the natural history museum on the left that's actually from the from the one in New York that's artist point uh, and then that's my photograph uh, on the right of uh, uh, kind of like mimicking the same view showing that the view existence in, in a similar way but photography is always about like how mimetic something is is it exactly like it what differs I, I've, I find all of those small changes interesting and maybe that's my background as a retoucher but there's uh, like attention to subtlety that I always bring to uh, to the projects um, so why I moved to the Natural History Museums is like somewhat obvious at this point, but there's a kind of cultural production that goes on in a Natural History Museum that um, isn't um, quite as tied to uh, the natural. It's more tied to, to science, and, and, and it's more uh, substantiated than in the parks. Uh, it's got, you know, it's got the weight of, uh, of state and science behind it. So here is a place that nature should I mean, if nature exists anywhere and it's defined anywhere, I thought it's, it's got to be here. Um, so it's it definitely worth looking at. Uh, and also very curious relationship to photography again in the Natural History Museum's Carl Ackley, best buddies with George Eastman. At the time in the founding of, of photography, also 1822, um, Louis Daguerre uh, was working on the very first uh, prints at the same time that they were they were beginning to create these dioramas, so that says to me that that's a that's a cultural event. That's not like it, this kind of seeing happened at this particular place at this particular time, and amongst a pretty small group of people. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and and here I'm just getting really interested in just small areas of these dioramas, like the the play of paint and photograph and the kind of looseness between the two. Um, Mark Dian, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Mark, Mark's work. Uh, he's an amazing uh, natural historian himself, an artist. Uh, I, we share pretty similar ideas on the museum. He says that the museum embodies the official story of a particular way of thinking at a particular time for a particular group of people. It's a time capsule and it should remain unchanged as a window into the obsessions and prejudices of a period. Uh, I'm totally with Mark on that. I mean, uh, it, I, I think that the Natural History Museum in New York is especially important, and if people want to update that museum, they should really just pick up and create a new one because it, it's, it's so much about that particular time, and I, I don't see how that could be lost. Again, with that really interesting mimesis going on between background and foreground. That's a, that's a kind of a little bit of a geeky retouching interest, actually. There's always that like negotiation between the background and the foreground going on in your compositing. Uh, also, it, one thing I've noticed from my time being a retoucher is that um, there's this strange relationship between um, what, what looks natural and unnatural. Uh, I'll get photographs all the time, and there'll be an area um, that's in the photograph that looks entirely retouched before it's ever, ever even been touched. There's a certain lexicon to the retouching language that exists in the real world, uh, and, and vice versa also. You know, there's a, 
a lexicon in the real, the, the, the simulated world, there are, thing, there are things in retouching that look very natural. Um, so there's just a, a, a funny play on that in the Natural History Museum that I love, love so much. Um, moving on to clouds. Uh, this was the next project in Nature by Proxy. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> another retouching thing. Um, so I kept making these photographs, and I think this happens to everyone. When, when somebody sees one of your photographs it, and they really like it, there's a few things they say. They either say, wow, nice camera, which is not part of the point, but pretty <laughs> funny. And, or they say, man, that looks just like a painting. Almost like congratulations, you've done it. <laughs> which I take as a pretty big compliment because I'm a big fan of painting. Uh, I look at a lot of it. Um, but th with this project, I began to be kind of interested in that. Like, well, when, when in the Natural History Museum does, does something sort of slide between painting and photograph? Or like, when are these moments where the, where the painting kind of breaks down? Um, this one's called losses, uh, after the painting term where uh, restorers come in to restore a painting. Um, and then I came to the conclusion that there's really no meaningful distinction to be drawn between reality and artifice. That like, I, like me as a photographer exploring nature, I could sort of let that go with this project. I didn't really need to draw out those kinds of distinctions and polemics anymore. No more, no more city versus rural, no more uh, fake versus real. We could just kind of exist in the middle. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this phenomenon uh, in terms of its scientific background, but it's got a, an amazing amount of, of cultural names behind it. Uh, scientifically, it's, it's basically just ice crystals being backlit by the sun. Uh, and it's called crepuscular rays, uh, scientifically. And um, there's an unimaginable amount of uh, common names, like God's rays, uh, Judea's rays, uh, Every, every major culture had come up with some kind of um, moral connection to this scientific phenomenon. Uh, wow, I sound like a real deconstructionist just at this very moment. But there's still so much of, of, of the romance that I believe in, although it doesn't seem so at this moment. Um, Oscar Wilde said in The Decay of of lying, people see fogs not because there are, are fogs, but because poets and painters have taught them the mysterious loveliness of such effects. So there's like this education going on from painting to photography and back from, from photography to painting. And And this is the, what the work looked like installed. Uh, this was my uh, graduate thesis. So we've kind of come to the end of my, my RISD experience. I did those three projects. Well, I did hundreds of projects, but those were the three standouts. Um, and uh, to go back, to circle back to retouching, um, there, was, there was a, my retouching grew tremendously uh, having gone through this particular project because of the sensitivity to color and how it's perceived and, and there's little, like very small differences between real and fake or uh, how illustrative one wants to be and the kind of like repetition and like the amount of images I was going through and processing and coloring and printing, um, just constantly printing also, getting away from the screen uh, and, and understanding how the images sit on the surface and and also that, that ink transfer, like how, do, how does that play into its either real or, or, or fakeness and um, uh, just such a foundational uh, a thing when it, when it plays back into the retouching world. And without further ado, a little bit of retouching. Uh, so on the commercial side, uh, I'm a senior retoucher at Cyan Jack. And um, I've been doing that for, I think, about 12 years. 
Um, before that, I was a, a photo assistant for many years, um, a uh, art director, uh, children's book illustrator, uh, and a uh, kayak dock hanging out guy, just sort of helping you get in your boat and like having a good time. Uh, high school. Uh, so this is Soir Blue by Edward Hopper. I'm sure you guys all recognize it. Um, and a, a guy just called me randomly while I was uh, at RISD and he said, um, you know, I, I love this painting and I want to make a photograph uh, inspired by it. And I really want to push my style towards more of a painterly aesthetic. So um, what can we do? Uh, and then the next thing he sent me was uh, this just like folder of raw images shot at, um, at dusk, I believe. And I, this is me sort of comping them together um, piece by piece. And th there was a certain part of me that just wanted to just stop right here. <laughs> and then there, there's always this other, um, this other voice in my head that says, if it looks impossible, let's, you know, let's do this. <laughs> it's like, there, I think a lot of researchers are almost like doctors. Like the bigger the emergency, the more excited they get. Like, oh my god, I'm going to be the first person to do double bypass. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> And uh, they gave me this background that was like just in a million pieces. It just all got stitched, you know, you, using your classic uh, camera raw um, pano stitch into Photoshop. Uh, and I ended up here, um, which is a long way. Oh, the, the photographer absolutely takes the credit because, well, it's his vision, but it's also this this painter, would, you know, he's not shy about sharing his references at all. I mean, it's, very, it's a very clear uh, reference to Edward Hopper. Um, uh, but as a, you know, as a retoucher, I do feel like I've got a, a large part to play. But as a retoucher, it's never necessarily my vision, per se, that's, um, you know, I think when someone takes credit, it's, it's, it's their vision. I think artists have always had these, these um, massive support networks. Uh, and, it, and it's always about what the image says internally that, that matters most, and that's when, that's when the credit is due. Um, so just a just a brief word. Now we could probably have a whole Q and A if you want to get more. That's a that's a fun one. Um, let's see. I'm going to pause right here. At I know you guys are just dying to know how that actually was put together, so I'm not just like showing this like crazy thing and you just have no, just have no abstract idea of what's actually occurring. So that's the panorama like stitched and uh, a little bit of f little fog kind of applied. There's the fog layer. And we've got our big Fence group, you know, as a retoucher, you got to be very organized with lots of groups, especially when you got a composite this big. Uh, there's all the fence pieces, and you can start turning the, the like the colors all wrong. I like to think in terms of like hard pixel layers at the as the base, and then build with my color on top. You have to think very componently. And, and I'm also thinking not just about color correction, but about light direction and everything that I know from my experience assisting in making my own photographs. Uh, like what, maybe the light was shot this way, but it may, you know, the direction or attenuation of a shadow should change. Uh, there's a big cast of characters here. Um, let's see. Oh my God, I overwhelm myself. Uh, yeah, so everybody's, so he's got some composited pieces on his collar and all of that, a lot of color correction. You know, the tables, we decided they were like shot with foil, but they should have looked like they were shot with wood. Uh, just a basic color correction. You know, you can see that really backlit lighting get kind of worked out there. Okay, I won't go into too detail. We have so many things to go over. 
lamps are doing their thing. The poll gets put in. I think I ended up just going into Google and looking up a nice like wood grain that I liked. And then um, I just created this tileable texture out of it. I, normally I would have a photograph of the, of the pool, but the photographer just didn't have the reference material for it. So I just took it as another challenge. And then we've got all our juicy color on top. The color is really where all the layers start to integrate and I can start to redirect the eye. And your basic sharpening on top. I think that's flat and there's a number of different sharpening in there like high pass and a little bit of unsharp mask and um, probably some other little channel chops. Okay. Meanwhile, back in Keynote. How long did you work on that? Um, that was a particularly long project. It was, a, it was kind of a personal project. I knew it was going to be an extreme challenge. So it was about four to five days. But, you know, these are normal eight, eight to nine hour days. Uh, so I, I, I hate to just talk about all these really arty things and then leave you with no real concrete hot tips because I know you guys are like retouchers come in and you want, you want juicy ones. And <laughs> This illusion of depth is probably one of the most important things I can tell you. And you can see it so much in that image. Um, it, it, so warm colors advance, cool colors recede. These are like basic graphic design-y kinds of principles, but you, you would be blown away how many photographers just sort of glaze over this stuff and, and just never really internalize it. And um, having that kind of power is, is unbelievable. If you, if you can get around Photoshop and the techniques are no problem, then you've got the problem of deciding what to do. And, and that's really the biggest problem. And, and the thing I see with junior retouchers coming in, it's always not that like they know where the buttons are and that um, they're decently fast. In the end, what creates the difference between uh, a young retoucher and a senior retoucher is their ability to make a lot of really tasteful decisions uh, that are aligned with the photographer's view. Uh, and you have to be able to adopt a lot of different styles if you're working for a lot of different photographers. Uh, and these principles um, come into play uh, really big time. Um, one, w one thing that I can um, kind of use to describe this next uh, little tidbit is uh, the mock band. I'm really interested in uh, illusions, and I have a big collection of them. The mock band is really fun because if you, if you look very carefully, uh, these, these are three identical solid uh, pieces of, uh, of tone. Uh, but yet, if you, if you look at the, the edge, right where um, one meets the other, you'll see one side has a light halo and the other side has a dark halo. And, and that's a really curious thing, because to me that says that your, your eyes are pulling an unsharp mask. It's doing exactly what unsharp mask is doing. It's looking for a light edge, it's making it darker. It's looking for a dark edge, it's making it lighter. Uh, or, or the opposite of that, depending on the, the tone. But it, it's creating more contrast on the edge. And it's only doing it on the edge. So public service announcement number one, the number one problem I see with retouching and prints, I'm sure we'll see it tons at, at Photo Plus. Um, these giant, like, you know, big banners. Uh, and these manufacturers want their images to look the best that they possibly can. So they go crazy with unsharp mask. They try to mimic this technique. Uh, and it just looks so horrible. Uh, and, and there's just no reason for it, because if you know this, um, you don't need to use all that unsharp mask. So anytime you feel yourself wanting to just drag up that slider just a little higher on your unsharp mask to make your image just a little bit crisper than everyone else's, make your lens look just a little more expensive. Uh, just don't, just stop right there. And I want you to look for the difference between the foreground and the background, like what it is you're trying to draw attention to. Um, and this is a classic figure versus ground. It's almost boring, like how common this is in graphic design. I'm sure you probably already heard it. But the, the, all you have to do is create the difference between two tones. Uh, and that can so easily be done, just pulling a curve and creating a mask. Um, so just look for light areas, make them lighter. Look for dark areas, make them darker, and contrast two elements. And there you go. You've got 
you've got sharpening and, and none of the negative effects. That's why when you ask a lot of retouchers, you'll get strange advice on sharpening. Some of them will bizarrely say at the very top, oh, we, we hardly even sharpen. <laughs> and like, how could that be possible? And, and, and this is kind of why. Um, if you want to get more into this, this uh, idea, I used to write for Resource Magazine several years ago. And there's, if you can dig them up, maybe you can talk to those guys or wrangle me. I wrote a bunch of articles about the principles of depth and how, how those things might apply to photographs in really practical ways. Um, so my, my commercial retouching, uh, I just wanted to go over uh, just some examples of things that I've done recently and how, how my fine art practice has played a, a role in, in these projects. This is a project called Fall for France, which the France Tourism Board sponsored for Art Basel. So they were printing these images. It's kind of a bizarre relationship between the commercial and the fine art world, where it's, it's at a fine art uh, community, but yet it's still trending towards the commercial. But that's something that I really enjoy as a retoucher to kind of uh, find a middle ground on that. Um, so this was, this is a, a mini frame composite, but I don't have time to go through all the details on this one. Um, there's another one. These are all uh, 10 to 12 frame composites, I believe. Some more, some less. That tiled textured roof is, uh, it's like four pieces and was a gigantic headache to align. Uh, this is a project called All Lo Love is Equal, also by Brad and Summers. Uh, and then just to show you that that's not all that I do, I want to give you a kind of an overview of uh, uh, retouchers are uh, kind of responsible for developing all kinds of different styles and functioning in all all different worlds. This is for the Pierre Hotel. Vince W. That's very recent, and I, I love that man. <laughs> you could tell. You could tell. I put a lot of love into him. Just a few product examples. So if you ask a retoucher, hey, uh, I saw a lot of um, people on your website or a lot of, a lot of products on your website. Like, can you do this other thing? The answer is usually like, yes, it's all, it's all pretty much similar. It's kind of strange that you ask for so many specialized portfolios. Um, I mean, maybe something as different as like automotive, maybe. If you're integrating a lot of 3D elements, you might need a bit more specialization. Okay, so uh, postgraduate school, things got a little strange for me because I was no longer in that environment and I had all these ideas about nature that were very conflicting. There were all these definitions of nature. And the first thing that I kind of started to play with, because uh, gr going to graduate school, as you new graduates may very well know, uh, the, the costs are just extraordinary. Um, um, we could talk a while on, on that. I mean, that's a social uh, problem that's very wide. Uh, but what that creates is it, that all of your, uh, your, your friends and, and the people that you meet in graduate school will then be forced into this work world in a very vigorous way. Uh, so you're, you're making all this work in graduate school and, and that's all you know. Uh, you're making so much work you don't even have a personal life. Uh, and then you're just, you're just doing nothing but not making art. You're, you're just working constantly. Um, and that's a really difficult thing to manage. Uh, and, and the only way that I've been able to make art is this, just to do what is just urgent to me, you know, like it just happens. Like I'm sitting at my desk and I was playing around with this, this cloud image which was part of another project uh, and I just started, I, I'm always taking these channel selections 
So I just went into the channels and I started moving them around. Um, I, I just couldn't help but be curious uh, while working. And um, that kind of led to uh, a more nuanced project uh, called Schema. And uh, we've got, there's a couple of books over there. Um, and I'll, I'll go over a few of the images of the front and back cover of the book. It was conceptualized as a book. Uh, some graphic designer friends of mine came along and said, hey, we've got this um, crazy printer. Um, do you have any ideas? Uh, and, and I just so happened to have been doing that channel stuff. And what I didn't like about doing the channels was that I actually had to go in there and move the channels around. It felt very forced. Like I was trying to make this point about how labor is always concealed. And, uh, and what I really wanted to see was the, um, the printer itself like implicated in the process of creating a, a natural image. Um, and this particular printer uh, just had all of those qualities. This is the printer warming up. I'm just going to go back. That's yellow, magenta, cyan, and the black plate. Uh, and it, as it's as it's warming up, it's, it's trying to be calibrated. Its color is spreading across the plates. Uh, and, and I also like that it never really reaches like full photograph. Um, it never quite mimics the landscape in a way that's particularly compelling as a photograph. But the, it's all the in-betweens that are interesting. Stuff? This is a risograph. It's a Japanese printer. It's an offset machine that's combined with digital technology, which is also a strange digital analog hybrid, which is interesting for you printing lovers out there. So you're seeing it build up and break down in it. These images are coming off the machine so fast. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the fastest printers in the world. I believe it's 300 pages per second is its max speed. The paper actually dents in the paper tray as it comes out, which is pretty extraordinary to watch. Uh, and like, there was a this similarity between like, the quickness that we absorb images um, through the internet and the, the quickness that we exchange them as cultural products. Uh, that r was really reflected in the machine itself. Like the machine was part of all of this to me. It, and, and the machine's hand, we talk a lot about, about the painter's hand and how photographers don't have a hand per se. Um, you know, they have a style, but they don't have a painterly hand. Uh, and, it, and it just, uh, it, was, it was very, uh, it was like a weight off my shoulders to see that the machine itself like had a hand of its own. Uh, and uh, these are the plates. Um, I just want to show this. this is behind the scenes. This isn't part of the project, but uh, you need to create four black and white plates to feed into this machine to create the, the master um, piece of cellophane that prints onto the uh, metal cylinder. And um, I had a, there was some creative liberties that I took with the processing of each plate. This is um, this is yellow. Um, magenta, cyan, and black. And then here's the result. Uh, so very lo laborious process. Because uh, I'm having to create four images and I'm, I'm actually uh, retouching and manipulating each channel. So there's like four, it's like I'm creating four images, feeding them all through the printer. Uh, one at a time. So the whole book went, well, the, the, that's more complicated, but the, the concept is that the book goes through four, four times. Then those images were scanned and then created into this particular publication. But there are original books um, that are available that um, are completely unique from book to book because um, the, each image was at a different stage of the warm up of the machine. That's Dan Graham's pavilion. The, the title schema is a relationship to um, one of his most seminal uh, poems on the deconstruction of a magazine called Schema.
you can even make out the, the plate previous to somehow got stamped onto the, the plate, the magenta, just the magenta plate. So you see like a tree <laughs> just kind of got mixed in with this crazy, chaotic, fast process. This is the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Uh, and that led me into botanical gardens. So th this is the first, that was the first uh, project in Techne Natura, uh, which is a riff on Systema Natura. Uh, the, um, that's the basic Linnaeus' organization of the entire natural world, uh, how we uh, classify animals and plants. Um, and it, so it's kind of like a classification of technology and how the botanical garden plays a, a role in that. Uh, and this is, uh, this is very, very new work. Um, it hasn't been published anywhere, so I thought it'd be fun to show you guys this. It's kind of in progress, uh, and it, I'm seeing it as a, a book form that says R combined to obtain binocular vision, if you can't read. And it's a stereogram. So it's meant to be seen in 3D. But of course, I'm joking a bit with that. I don't really mean for you to see it in 3D. Uh, the image on the left is actually a natural occurring phenomenon called lenticular clouds. That's pretty bizarre that it actually happens. And on the right is a, a very sort of regional effect. That was the Nikon booth at Photo Plus a few years ago. Uh, that one says, read down, take care, last word, must look more near. Let the eye see the top one far off. And that's my last slide. Please, please ask me tons of questions. I left plenty of time for them knowing that I was just going to bat them out of the park. <laughs> On on the images of uh, the the women, uh, just was there any nip and tuck there, or was it just tonal? Sorry, which image? The images of the of the women, the female models. Uh huh. Was it nip? Was there any nip and tuck, or was it just tonal? Tonal. Uh, it's generally a little bit of both. I, I try not to use liquify, if at all possible. Now, the, the cases that I like to use liquify are when somebody is wearing a garment that just happens to get unfortunately folded in a way that makes their body um, seem like either larger or smaller than they actually are. Uh, so I'll, I'll sort of correct that or if there's any kind of lens distortion that causes a, uh, the shape of someone's head to be elongated or oddly narrowed, then those are cases that I'll, I'll use liquify to, um, to put things back into a a more natural state, pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wait, wait, one, what? One more. I hesitate to ask people about something that they don't do, but your landscapes seem to me, all of them, quintessentially American. That's mm -hmm. a good thing. Um, and I wondered if in your studies or in your explorations of the nature of landscape, whether you explored Asian landscape, Chinese landscape, which seems to me conceptually quite different. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely different. And I have, I have looked into it to a certain extent. Um, but my, my reason for, for deciding that, and, and 
I, I'm absolutely a lover of the American version of this story. And, and there are national parks all across the entire world. I could have gone to national parks in Italy or France or, or, or anywhere. In fact, some of them are far more stunning than anything you would find here. Um, but uh, the reason that I, that I haven't yet uh, is that nature is a narrative. And I'm an American artist. And I, I can only speak to the place that I'm from. Like I, I can hardly make photographs in New York being from Seattle, as you can see. I'm just so affected by my environment, and I'm responding to that environment, and I don't live in China. So I, I don't think I have any business really talking about what- There was no implicit yeah. criticism or anything sure. about it. I just, I was curious. I guess it went back to the, um, to the professor at Brown that you quoted, mm -hmm. because um, even that, con that conceptualization of the landscape is, is very different than what it might be in Asian skull painting or something. Um, not the Eden, but the Shangri-La, um, the, um, the way in which one traverses the landscape. Mm -hmm. when you walk through. And they, anyway, it's very different. I don't normally like to ask someone a question about what they don't do, but I, I was just curious. And the, this is an unrelated question. Um, I got a little confused. Did you go to graduate school after you had been out in the field doing these other things? I don't know what the, the chronic, because you mentioned the various things that you did, um, illustration and retouching and other, other kinds of things in the arts. Um, did you do undergraduate and then uh, work yes, out I sort of, I glazed over some biographical details, uh, <laughs> which you can look up, but uh, essentially the short of it is that uh, yeah, I've been involved with this for a long time. My undergraduate degree was in special effects, which is, you'll see that coming in. Um, and, and the first job was as an illustrator. Uh, and then it was a long period between uh, the undergrad and the grad in which I was working professionally as an assistant and then a retoucher. And, and then um, the, the retouching just was going on through that entire period. Um, with the cost of graduate school. It wasn't something that I could totally cut off. I, re I reduced my workload, but I was definitely still working through that, that whole period and still working today. As a retoucher, are there times where, where you are really at odds with your client? Uh, Since you're also a, an artist in your own right and producing your own bodies of work? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't feel a sort of tension with a client. But the, uh, I, I don't know if this is unique to me, but I, I feel a really strong responsibility to images because I feel like the images are somehow separate. Like we create them and it's a product and it's, it's outside of ourselves. And um, when an image is speaking a particular language, I feel I, I, can, I have tension with, with what that image is saying or how it's saying it. I think that's more, I don't always think about like, oh, my client's asking me to do this, and you know, I don't agree with that. Um, if that's the case, then they typically aren't a client that I'm, I probably would have hooked up working with anyway, because they, they wouldn't be into the kind of style of work that I do. Yeah. Thank you, it was a great presentation. Um, you had showed a slide about the subtleties of retouching. And as you know, us being grad students and coming into retouching in not so much a systematic way, can you throw that slide back up again about the, um, it's like four or five? Oh, that, one. that one? Yes. Um, so as far as, when I look at your retouching, it's, it seems very natural, very painterly, versus a lot of the retouching you see today it just seems very plastic and synthetic. Um, in your process, how do you see that when you go into a picture? Oh, well, that's exactly why I did this whole presentation. Because <laughs> a lot of retouchers, they, they, um, they, they don't make photographs. So many of them don't. Yeah. Uh, and that's the only way that you can actually gain that kind of sensitivity. Like to the, to, I mean, I'm not going to say that the most amazing retouchers out there aren't just naturally gifted and can sort of sense that in a second. There are many of them that can. But the one thing that you can do if you want to be proactive is get out there and and look. It's just it's about perceiving. It's just the more the more carefully you can sense the difference between two tones, 
uh, the more the more that you understand like what what's real and what's not. Um, I think one thing that really helps in retouching also another little tiny trick is just well not a tiny trick it's a massive trick that we use every day and you're, it's, it's like I'm going to say it and you're like yeah I already do that but before and after in comparison like I can't stress it enough um, a lot of times when I'm doing final color even though I have this sensitivity sometimes when I'm doing like the last pass of color on something I'll pull up like 10 of my favorite images of a skin tone and just adjust the skin tone like there's that kind of like quick compare and contrast and time and color is everything uh, if you study color theory you know that like if I if I look at Katrine Kurt, <laughs> Katrine's um, magenta shirt and then I look over here and I try to make a magenta shirt like that's too far that's way too far you're gonna forget uh, like you can you think that you know but it's got to be if you're trying to get somewhere you got to be looking at it right next to the thing that you're if you want something to appear more natural, you better be looking at some images that are really natural to you. Uh, and at the very least, you know, like flip through your reference folder and just at least have them in the back of your mind if that's all you can do. But uh, so much of it is just click back to that before, before you started retouching and click after and uh, pull up as many references as you can. Um, I had one more question for you. You um, you did the front part of your presentation was about researching um, painting and other ways of thinking about nature, museums, botanical gardens, etc. Um, and that's a kind of backward look in terms of research. Do you ever spend time trying to second guess the future and how nature is going to continue evolving or devolving or Yes, uh, that's exactly, that's where I'm at right now. And in fact, I don't even, I don't always show this much of the past uh, because, because this journey is so linear. Like I even look at some of these initial experiments and then just realize how naive they are in terms of my understanding of the natural world. Every time I do a new project, it just, uh, my idea of what's worth looking at grows so much. Uh, but I think there's so much to be learned about my particular journey because I feel like it's something that so many of us are embarking on with uh, the kinds of tragedies in the world that we see coming, uh, the, the sea level rise and um, our gigatons of, uh, of emissions and, and, and all of these things I think are extremely environmental, uh, they're of environmental concern to a great number of people and we're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, there was a story that I glossed over that I want to go back to that I think will help. Um, when, I, when I first started doing this, I read about a legal battle between a logging group in the Northwest and an environmental group. And I read all the transcripts and um, what they kept circling back to, this, this, this legal battle went on far too long. And the reason it kept circling back was that neither of them had any idea what nature was. They kept using it as a term and they were using it on their own terms. They were, they were just using it to prove whatever they wanted to prove. And in a legal battle, that's just not going to fly. Uh, and, and I see that all of our decisions that we make about how to conserve, how to be good stewards of the environment, all of that comes back to our understanding of the natural world. And uh, we can't do that unless we have a really nuanced understanding of, of what these things are and our relationship to them. We can't be thinking nature is just in national parks. Uh, we have to start caring about um, the, you know, the just little bits of tundra that are, uh, you know, on the, the shoots of grass next to uh, a Manhattan shoreline. Uh, the, the pavement that we all walk on, it's not particularly very comfortable. The city's pretty loud. You know, these are, uh, we, could, we could treat uh, Manhattan in many of the same ways that we treat nature's other places. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on, in fact, is called Park Avenue. It hasn't made its way to light, but I've just been walking up and down Park Avenue because nature exists just as much there as it does anywhere else in the world. So um, I, I'm trying to think about what it means to look at nature on Park Avenue, um, where it's not supposed to be. Um, so I think this is just something we need to continue pushing on. 
to, to come to a collective decision. Uh, and it, it really is, I can't stress enough that it, this is a utopia, this vision of the world after um, capitalism. It, it's, uh, we need to come up with a dream together and, and it has to be that urgent. Um, I know that utopianism has been knocked down uh, over the years as a philosophical idea, but uh, uh, the ability to dream on that scale is, is um, that's exactly what we need. And I, and I think that through photography and art, we are the stewards of uh, that, that kind of thinking about the natural world. Uh, so I feel tremendously responsible uh, to, to find my own way through it and, and hopefully share that with other people. Well, uh, thank you so much, Stefan, for uh, getting our fall season started. Uh, so, so, so great. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Good to have you. Time in the way that geologic time uh, actually occurs in, in, the, in the landscape, uh, and also how like space and, and place and time all, all relate to one another. Uh, you get a sense from these images, like what kinds of environments, I mean, some of these are photographs from my home, um, some of them are from backyards, but it, it's just such a different place than 25th Street in Manhattan. Uh, this is an image, uh, uh, we've closed the related project, uh, this is an image of me uh, I'm four years old, and uh, we took uh, many trips um, to not just, you know, Seattle's a somewhat rural area. It's not particularly remote, but this, uh, this particular trip, I, I was out in the Bowron, um Lakes, which is northern Minnesota, uh, completely remote, like nothing for, for God knows how many miles. Uh, and we were there for 30 days at a time. So that's a pretty significant experience to have at such a young age. And... Uh, it, it's affected everything that I've done since. Um, this is me at three years old. Uh, I actually wanted to be an architect when I, when I grew up. Uh, it never quite happened. It turned out there was way too much math involved. Um, <coughs> I did actually, <laughs> I did have a couple of days with the architect, but I think he, he understood very clearly that 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 was not the path for me. Although, to my surprise, I've become somewhat of a, a closeted uh, architect in, in a way looking at landscape architecture, and you'll kind of see that connection as we go on. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about like how much research goes into some of these projects. Um, it's not that I'm just sort of moving about the landscape, just seeing what I see. Uh, having gone to grad school, I know that everyone's process is very different. And uh, I could see right away that my process was um, deny the fact that he's used nature in this way. It's, it's really curious. Um, this painting, it, another amazing Frederick Edwin Church. Um, this is 1857. This is probably one of his most popular, and, uh, and by popular, I mean pop. I'm, people drove from hundreds of miles away to go see this thing. They paid 25 cents to see one painting. I don't think that's... Maybe that's happened before. I certainly know of nothing within my lifetime of that kind of um, intensity and interest in one painting or, or one photograph for that matter. Um, but I show this to sort of illustrate um, the sort of verisimilitude, uh, verisimilitude of uh, painting, the, the amount of detail uh, everyone marveled at. Um, and it, it was also just the, the falls themselves. And um, this is the same fall uh, in 1969 on the left, uh, after agriculture and um, other industry had pulled so much water out of the Niagara Falls that there really, it was basically a trickle, as you can see. Uh, and this was of a big concern, yet it took many, many years to um, do anything about it. But it, it's something, the reason I chose this is it's something that I've always thought of as a sort of like, if I was to draw a, a list of nature, it, it, would, it would fall right in there, the Niagara Falls. I mean, that's Frederick Edwin Church, that's what we've based um, all of our ideas on. And um, yet, it, there's this uh, 
this manipulation of it in a way that's so um, revealing of what nature could really mean. Uh, the, the fact that, that later in the 1990s, we finally got there, there was, I'll save you the long story, but um, it, see, it has seen very many iterations in the actual landscape. And they were talking about, you know, how grand should it be? Should we put a rock to the left or to the right? Um, it was a lot of thought that, that went into it. Um, so that I take that same kind of research uh, just in... Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have artist, retoucher, and educator Stefan Sackmiller as tonight's guest speaker. Stefan holds an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. His artistic practice is an exploration into our evolving perception and experience of nature in modern life. Exhibitions include International Center of Photography, Times Square Art Alliance, and the Griffin Museum of Photography. His latest project, Schema, was published by Sun Editions. Stefan serves as principal at New York City retouching studio Cyan Jack, where he has worked on numerous national and international advertising campaigns. As such, he has won the Communication Arts Photo Annual Award of Excellence. His work has been published widely in Vogue, Art Forum, Interview, W, and the New York Times. So please help me welcome Stefan Sackmiller to our lecture series. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Katrine. Thank you, SVA. It's really an honor to be here speaking to you guys today. Um, and I, I think it's particularly uh, apropos that I, I recently graduated, you know, three to four years ago, and much of this talk is, is um, surrounding my experience um, both pre, during, and, and post-graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, so I, I think you'll find that um, pretty applicable. Um, so a little bit about me. I, uh, I'm originally from Seattle. Um, I, I had these amazing experiences out in, in, in the rural areas of Seattle um, that are very unlike they are here, but yet I packed up was perhaps way too thorough. I, I got that comment lots. Uh, but it's my life, and uh, I really enjoy the library, I, even if it's not that popular. Um, it's something, it's, I, I just enjoy this topic. I, I'm absolutely p just fascinated by it. And um, so, the amazing thing about the RISD grad program is that there's this connection to Brown University, which is this wonderful university, and they have one of the best natural history departments in the country. And so I was taking um, proper academic coursework in natural history, and I was introduced to a writer named Bill Cronin, who wrote um, a, a wonderful essay and, and, of course, many, many books thereafter about similar topics uh, called The Trouble with Wilderness. And, um, he came up with three myths of nature. Uh, the first is uh, nature is Eden. Uh, and by that he means an Edenic narrative. Uh, and that's a nature that's kind of stable, but yet uh, if any sort of humanity comes in, then that nature would be sort of out of balance. Um, he's also got another one that's a, just a very typical myth you hear about nature, nature as naive reality. Um, that would be one that is, uh, it's sort of, we see nature, uh, even though it's a cultural construct, as something that is, because it's nature, then it's real. It's a concrete real, yet um, that's just a very common fallacy. Um, and, and then the last one, nature is moral imperative. That is, as Americans, that's something that we have a really hard time letting go of. And that's what this uh, slide, uh, I came upon it in the library, and it just really hit me, it's probably uh, in the most clearly uh, formal appropriation of, of moral nature that I've ever seen, uh, painting a flag just uh, right in the middle of the sky. That's, um, I mean, Frederick Edwin Church is America's painter. I, I really, I absolutely love him, but at the same time, uh, I can't 
to a couple of boxes, and I took an Amtrak without ever having even visited uh, New York City or even anything in the, the East Coast. So uh, I just arrived in Penn Station and started there. Um, the first project uh, on returning back to Seattle from that experience in New York, um, just as a vacation, I didn't, I didn't move back, but um, the first project there was this project related. And it became the foundation for the work that I would do in graduate school. And what I was looking at was mainly my family as they existed in the types of typical places you would find in the Northwest. Uh, but there was a question that surrounded all of the images that I continue to focus on even to this day. Um, all of my work is, is related to a sort of singular um, goal, uh, a singular mindset, a singular subject. Although you'll see many subjects, there's, there's always one thing that ties everything together, and that's the epistemology of nature. It's this question, uh, epistemology is a philosophical term, basically meaning what is nature? We ask that question. How do we come to know it? And how is it that we know what we know about it? It's a, it's a pretty simple question to ask. Uh, but the, m the more I ask, uh, the less I, I seem to come to any kind of concrete conclusion, which is um, something that just keeps driving work, which is uh, an amazing thing to start with that. So it's really just a simple goal to understand nature. Time is, is kind of a fickle thing in photographs. Um, and, and how I created these was I was making hundreds of small four by six prints, and I just had them laid out in the studio. I was literally just swimming in prints, kind of arranging one to the next, um, looking at the way that, that time uh, became sort of de 